Welcome to Business Done Differently, the podcast about challenging the status quo, creating fans first, and changing the game in business. I'm your host, Jesse Cole, and it's showtime. Our guest today is Josh Linkner, the reinvention guru and creative troublemaker who went from jazz musician to CEO of five multi-million dollar tech startups, to founding Detroit Venture Partners, to becoming a New York Times bestselling author and international speaker. His books, Road to Reinvention, Discipline Dreaming, and Hacking Innovation have been game changers for our business and companies all over the world. I've become a huge fan and pumped to connect with my friend today. Josh, welcome to Business Done Differently. Jesse, so great to be with you. Thanks, man. Yeah, fired up that we connected about over a month ago and obviously speaking the same language, you've been proving it with many companies and obviously as reinventors, we care about what's next. What's the future? What are we doing now? And I know your past work, we want to get into it, but you have a book that you're very excited about, Big Little Breakthroughs. I'd love to know what you found in this as the next step into reinvention and innovation. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm super excited about the new work, which will be out in April, called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. And really the whole mission, and my mission, frankly, is to help everyday people become everyday innovators. And it really demystifies the creative process. Basically says, you don't have to be wearing a lab coat or a hoodie to be innovative. This is like innovation for the rest of us. And so instead of helping people aim for giant wins, like a billion dollar idea or transforming a new drug therapy, it's how do you cultivate the little acts of daily creativity that each individually can be really meaningful in your life. And then also, if you really do want the big ones, the best way to get to the big ones is to build the skills through the little ones. So it democratizes creativity and innovation, giving people the tools and the mindsets to really tap into this dormant creative capacity that most of us have. And so I've invested over a thousand hours personally into the book, tons of research, fun, fresh stories. It's not like, oh, look what Elon Musk did. It's like, look what this weird guy in Berlin did and how cool is that? So in your spirit of business done differently, this is sort of like innovation done differently. All right. The weird guy from Berlin. You say you're a collector of stories, all right? And I think I love that. Every company might have a mission statement vision, but do they have stories that back up you know, what they're doing? And so if there is actually a weird guy in Berlin who did something, or if there's some small companies that are doing things that we don't know about that you found that you'd love to share some of the insights. Boy, we could chat for hours on it. And that's really what I focus on, man. I love underdogs. You know, it's one thing if, if a giant corporation can do something interesting, but I love the people like you that have done more with less and been really scrappy. And so there actually is a weird guy from Berlin So check this out. Imagine you're at this outdoor concert, this festival, and and fans are cheering along to the music and the bass player's thumping along and the drummer's rocking and all of a sudden there's a flute solo that rips across the crowd. But the weird thing is this. They aren't even real human beings. It's a robot band. So the band is called the One Love Machine Band and it's all made up of robots. So now that's kind of interesting to begin with, but here's the best part. They aren't from like NASA there's this weird guy named Kolja Kugler in Berlin, and he makes each of these robots using junk. Literally, it's scrap metal parts that he found in some junkyard. He found like the bass player's leg it was a gasket cover that he found discarded in an alley. And so every single part of this live music band that he controls through pneumatics, which is pumping air through different parts of these weird musicians, there's this literally, it's a live band that he's controlling with like a rusted out, half broken keyboard and they're playing music together. And it's all with junk parts. He didn't pay a cent for any of the parts. And today, they like tour the world. He's got a bigger fan club than most live musicians. He's this wildly successful artist who creates moving musical art from junk. So what did you learn from him? You hear this story, you're like, all right, this is innovative. What, what did you like take away from this guy from Berlin? Well, one thing is that, you know, we often think that when we want to be creative, we want to do something that really leaves our mark. The first thing in our mind, we go to, what am I lacking? I don't have enough money, I don't have enough training, I don't have this, I don't have that. And here's the thing, Jesse, if resources equated to your ability to be innovative, the federal government would be the most innovative organization on the planet and startups would be the least innovative organization. And we know that that's flip-flop. So here's this guy, he was like living in a van or something, but he saw beauty and art in what other people saw as worthless. And the fact that he had this vision, that he created it out of nothing, that he figured stuff out along the way, you know, he didn't know anything about pneumatics, which is the engineering process of pumping air into things to get like fingers to move on a robotic bass player. But he took his time, he figured it out. He let his creativity lead the way. And in turn, he's been able to accomplish really remarkable success doing more with less. He let his, again, his creativity was mm-hmm. the most powerful resource at his disposal. I love it. You know, you talk about finding the empty closets, kind of like a Regis Hotel did. 
And that inspired us because, you know, everyone has these things that people don't look much at. They don't pay attention to. Even in our stadium, Josh, 1926 ballpark, the bathrooms are old, all right? We used to have troughs in there. I mean, the guys, it was nasty, all right? A disaster. But, you know, we said, all right, we don't have the money to make it the Ritz-Carlton bathroom. We just don't have the money. So we picked on our rival, the Macon Bacon, and, you know, we put Macon Bacon urinal cakes in every single men's urinal. So our fans are peeing on our rival. And we said, all right, that cost us, I think all the urinal cakes for two years cost us $1,000, but fans go in there and laugh. And then we said, all right, let's take it to the next level. So we just purchased Macon Bacon toilet paper. So our fans will actually be wiping there <laughs> with our rival. A very small cost, but again, it's looking at that type of bathroom experience that's not the main stage at our stadium. And as you said, finding the beauty in other things. And maybe a good segue to the empty closets, because every single company has these, but they don't look at them. Yeah, and for what you're referring to, for the folks listening, is that St. Regis Hotel in Washington, D.C., like all of us, they're trying to reinvent their business. They're trying to look at new ways of doing things and better serving their customers. So they start looking around the hotel and they found that the empty closet, which is in every hotel room, exactly the same around the world. But they said, you know, wait a minute, maybe we could do something different here. And so here's what they did. They partnered up with Neiman Marcus, luxury retailer. And now as a guest, before you arrive, you're sent an email asking about your size and your fashion preferences. So you walk into that room, you open up the closet, and it's not empty. It's filled with hand-selected goods just for you. So the way it works, you try them on in your room. If you like it, just walk off with it. It's auto-built to your hotel invoice. So here's what they did. If you think about it, like you, they did it with no extra cost because they partnered up with Neiman Marcus. They created a completely different experience for their customers, a competitive differentiator. They created a new revenue stream because now they've activated their closet, which is a dead space into it, and like a closet commerce activity. Just on and on, it was a total win. Again, it didn't require huge resources, quite the opposite. It just required a little creativity. And it started, if I remember correctly, with a small bet, which I'm sure if you're talking about some of the insights from Big Little Breakthroughs, small bets is probably a big aspect of that. Because if I remember correctly, they did one floor or one room, or they just tested it a little bit, saw that it worked, and then moved on. Is that correct? Yeah. And you know, it's so important. I'm glad you brought that up because when we think of trying something new or crazy, you know, the first thing we go to after I don't have enough resources, the next thing we go to is, oh man, what if it doesn't work? And so we do this risk reward calculation and we say, well, it's probably safe to do nothing. And if I try something, I have to roll it out like universally and it seems really big and risky. My suggestion for anyone listening is we should all be running constant sets of little experiments. Fixed time, fixed money. So St. Regis didn't do that across every hotel around the globe. They did it with like one guest in one floor. So let's see if it works. And then once it did, they didn't do it like, again, okay, let's roll it out company-wide. They did it with like, two guests on two floors. And so if you just break your ideas down into small, teeny, manageable experiments that you're always running, knowing full well that 80% of them will not work, fine, discard it. But the ones that do work, then you just expand the size of that experiment. If that works, expand the size of that experiment. So by the time you're rolling something out system or company-wide, or you make it a big deal in your life or business, you've already tested it out. Like you already know you've de-risked the process. I love that. You know, I want to get into maybe some companies that are doing this, maybe not from the top down. You know, Josh, everyone thinks, you know, you got Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos and Reed Hastings, but maybe bring in ideas from the bottom up because we are so driven and trying to focus by that. I heard in the book, No Rules Rules by Reed Hastings, he says they talk about everyone picturing they have poker chips and they have to start using those chips. So that's fine. I actually just bought a bunch of bananas poker chips and everyone's going to have them. And every quarter, they have to actually put them out and use them to get these small bets. And we use every game as a small bet opportunity. What are we trying new for food and bet? What are we trying new for promotions? I really want to get how can a company or maybe some companies that are doing this, maybe from the bottom up, whether it's someone in this department, this department, not the CEO. Did any stories come through, big little breakthroughs that stood out? Yeah. you know, The whole idea here is essentially having a culture or a mindset of constant experimentation. So when we think about change, change is scary because what's the downside? Am I giving up success? Blah, blah, blah. But I would just encourage people, don't even think about wide sweeping chains. Just think about lots and lots of experimentation. And whether you're a big company or a little one, we should always be testing little things. One thing I really admire about you is that you're testing something every game. And some of them work great and you keep, some of them you discard. And that to me is just such a beautiful thing. And again, the whole point here is that you're de-risking the process of innovation. One story I was so excited to share with you, Jesse, is I was thinking about you, my guy who loves bananas. So think about this. You go into the grocery store and you want to buy some bananas. But you're kind of stuck with this problem. Do you buy the yellow bananas or the green ones? If you buy the yellow bananas, they're good today. Four days later, the rest of the bunch is all mushy. If you buy the green bananas, you have to wait like a week and a half to have a decent banana. 
Now imagine that instead of you being in the banana business as it relates to baseball, you're in the actual banana business. So what do you possibly do? Like, that's just how bananas are. And most people would instantly say, nothing I can do, that's how bananas are. But there's one company in Korea that took a different approach. What they did is they packaged their bananas in a small little package organized by ripeness. So you get this package of seven bananas. It's the banana a day package. And one's like perfectly ripe today. The next one is almost ripe, so tomorrow to be great. And it's like a color wheel. It goes over all the way to green. So by day seven, that green one is perfectly ripe for you. So keep in mind, Jesse, like same bananas. They didn't reinvent the banana. They just marketed it differently. And so here's what ended up happening. First of all, they're absolutely crushing their competition in terms of sales volume. Second of all, they're charging three times per ounce of banana compared to the competitive set. It's a massive, gigantic economic win for this banana company, who again, it's the same bananas, but they added a little bit of creativity to it. You think about fans first, they thought about customers first. They solved a different problem in a creative way and absolutely enjoying a landslide victory. I think you talk about this from Road to Reinvention. They go from the customer's mindset. They ask these, what, 20 questions that you can ask the customer. You know, how do they buy? When do they buy? Just go through that process. Is that one of the ways to innovation? Like that process literally looked at, A, here's a friction point, which is a starting point on all innovation. But then every part of the customer process, they question. Is that how they or how you would teach this to any company? Yeah, what I would really recommend people do is a saying I talk about in the new book, which is fall in love with the problem. So too often we have a solution in mind and we're so focused on the solution, but that solution may or may not be the best one and we can become blinded by it. We get tunnel vision. What I think the best innovators of all sizes and shapes do is they fall in love with the problem. So back to the banana company, what's the problem? The real problem is that customers have an issue. Like they don't know which bananas to buy. If they buy too many and they go ripe too quickly, they waste bananas, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of looking at the problem, like I have to get bananas to stay ripe longer, they said, The real problem that we're falling in love with is the customer problem. And so by immersing themselves in the customer problem, by bathing in the problem, by willing to be open-minded and explore lots of different solutions, even the less traditional ones, in order to solve it, I think we as innovators, too often we leap to a conclusion and then we're like sticking to it no matter what, as opposed to falling in love with the problem and being committed, most importantly, to solving that, regardless of how you manage to do so. It's so fascinating. And you also understand the long game. I'm sitting here thinking, I've been in love with the problem that baseball is too long for 13 years. And it's still too long. And the problem I see every game is people leave in the sixth or seventh inning every single game. And finally, we started testing a two-hour time limit and realized what happened. But there's still other ways to do that. And that obsession is what will get you to that next step. Finally, you say, oh, it's a problem. We'll focus on something else. We can't fix that right now. All right, you got me fascinated. But I want to continue going here. And I want to do the opposite. Because you talk about the judo flip. And you know, whatever's normal, do the exact opposite. So I'm going to do that here on this show. Well, typically, we just keep having questions. We are going to go into a game now. All right. Are you mentally prepared? I'm ready to rock, man. That's awesome. awesome. So we'll call this the second inning stretch instead of the seventh inning stretch, which now we do with the Richard Simmons impersonator at our games doing some weird hip thrusts and crowd. That's a whole nother story. So here is the second inning stretch for you. It's a game, truth and dare. Which one would you like first? Truth and dare. You know, it's not a pick. Yeah, you, get, you have to do both. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Which one would you like first is the real question. Well, let's do truth and then dare. All right, true. So I want to know something that you learned from running companies or even working with companies that you were trying to innovate, but it didn't work. What was something that you tried to follow one of your rules that you've learned about reinvention? You're like, that didn't work. What did you learn from it? Does anything stand out? Yeah. You know, it's funny. So I thought I was following a rule and then it turned out that I stumbled on it. So one thing, you know, we had this idea. So in terms of backdrop, I started a company in 1999 called ePrize, where we designed, built, and ran digital promotions for large brand advertisers. It's kind of like half software company and half ad agency. Yes. And we had a pretty good run. Like we grew to, you know, 500 plus people, offices throughout the US, worked with 70 of the top 100 brands. We had this idea, which was, hey, let's democratize this type of technique and let's make a self-serve version for small advertisers. So they could compete head to head with Coca-Cola. And that was a judo flip. Like, hey, instead of doing it for the big guys, let's do it for the small guys. So there were some elements that we really did follow our mantra of being innovative. But what I failed to do was we like kept it in a lab. We thought of ourselves as our, our customer as opposed to trying it out in the real world. We kept in stealth mode. We invested all this money and then we like released it to the world hoping for magical results and it just launched to a fizzle. And we sort of missed the customer in the whole thing. 
We didn't take our time to really get close to the customer need. We didn't take the time to really understand distribution. And frankly, we launched a beautifully cool technology that nobody wanted. And we learned a lot from it. We ended up salvaging a lot of that technology, but it was sort of a painful lesson. And I think the point is that we didn't experiment with it. We didn't test it out with the market. We thought we were smarter than we really were. And that backfired for us. Uh, so fast. And, and that's proven over and over again with Quickster, with Netflix. They didn't test it all. They just said, we're doing this big split and boom, it hit. Like you have to test it with your customers. And even if it sounds like just test it, our tap of the morning beer festival, only hundred people showed up. It didn't work, but you tested it. We could have set, talked about it for a year and not done it. And then did this big launch and put resources and time. And so obviously now you're moving much faster than you used to move. Yeah. So that taught us to do something different. We then launched something called Mach 10 Innovation, where instead of like inventing something in the back room and spending a ton of money and time, we just started marketing ideas. We would bring to the market like 10 different ideas a month to clients. And it was like a one sheet. It was basically a prototype. And then we would let a clients vote with their wallet. So if they bought number three, we'd then like scramble around in the back room and build it in a sloppy manner. And we'd overinvest and would probably lose some money on it. But at least we knew it was validated by an actual paying customer. You know, another example, Jesse, I just read about today is Quibi. So Quibi, Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman, they invested $1.7 billion and they got all excited about this idea and it just wasn't a hit with the market. They're shutting it down. And so a good way to think about it, because I've reflected on this you know, for many years, is I think that ideas come to life as the intersection between religion and science. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Religion, that's your vision. Like that's your bull. Like, oh, I see the world differently and it isn't proven, but I believe it in my heart. And I believed in my heart that small advertisers wanted the same thing as Coca-Cola. But where I failed is I then didn't look at the science part of it, which is, okay, are you testing? Are you measuring? Are you making sure that things are validated, that things are actually working? One without the other is a problem. If you're all science and no religion, you're a stifling bureaucracy that does nothing cool. If you're all religion and no science, you know, this is where these big flameouts, pets.com or now Quibi, you know, they had this vision, but they had, didn't really take the time to test it out with the scientific approach. The intersection of religion and science, that's the way to go when you're thinking about innovation. I love it. Fascinating right there. All right. Don't think you're getting away from the dare. All right. We just got a great tangent, all but right. they're still the dare. All right. Dare on. All right. So the dare on is another promotion we do at the field. It's called the sing off. It's usually 2000 fans in the main grandstand versus 2000 fans in the bleachers. We play a song when it stops, you have to finish that song lyric. Today, there's only one contestant, Josh, and that's you. So when the song stops, I know you'd rather be playing a guitar, but when the song stops, you have to finish that song lyric. And I'm going to your roots here a little bit. Okay, here we go. You ready? All right, let's try it. I'm so embarrassed to say I don't know it. I know it's Eminem because that's a Detroit. Uh, isn't that right, Eminem? Yep, yep. You nailed that one. Lose yourself I, in I'm, the moment. You own it. <laughs> I, you know, I'm so embarrassed to say, you know, it's too bad. Like if you had a jazz leader from the 1940s, I would remember it. And this one, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't I know how to pick a jazz know. song. I don't know how to, I mean, jazz, I just feel like you're in the moment. Everyone's just jamming out. I didn't know it. All right. But I went Detroit, Eminem. You got 70% of the answer correct. So you should hey, well, while we're at it though, I, you know, just you're talking about jazz. So I, I'm a passionate jazz musician. Like I've been playing for over 40 years. That was really my business school training. And I just want to say like, I think you play jazz, even though you maybe don't know all the intricacies of it. Jazz is basically a creative conversation. You're riffing off ideas with one another. You're trying stuff and then it's messy at times and you go out on a limb and then you have to course correct and you're building your creative confidence one step at a time. And I think business and the work that you're doing certainly is an example of jazz. You're not playing with a saxophone or a guitar. You're playing with a yellow suit. Thanks. Thank you. But when it works, it's magical. It is the most magical moment. Everything stops and you can just feel it. And when you're playing, you can feel it with the musicians, I'm sure. And you can also feel it with the audience and the energy level coming together. Yeah. The cool thing about jazz, so only about 1% of the notes that you play are on the written page. There's some chord structures and such, but the, most of it is just like made up as you go. And so if you and I were in a jazz group, we could play the same song for five years in a row every night and it would never be the same song. Like you're always shifting it around. And that's, again, that's what you do every night with the Savannah Bananas. I know this isn't jazz, but on a quick riff here, one of my favorite bands and the reason why they sell more tickets than anybody and every year sell out everyone is Dave Matthews Band. And you think about them and the improvisational they do. They do have a saxophonist, they have trumpet, they have some of those elements, but it's constant improv and you go every night and they may play the same songs, but it's a completely different experience. And that's my challenge at our ballpark every night is to not have the same experience and probably the same thing for every business. New is a way of life. That's what makes you interesting and relevant. Well, think about this too. I would argue that there's been a shift in the business world for companies big and small. And that in the past, doing business was like a classical symphony conductor. That person is no longer even playing an instrument. Yeah. They're just, you know, let's say that's the CEO. 
And it's all about alignment and precision and getting people to play the notes exactly as they're written on the page. Problem is, now we're living in a world that is too complex and too fast moving to play classical music. I think the world we're living in now is jazz, where it's small teams that are bouncing, they're passing the baton of leadership back and forth. It's messy. They're trying stuff. They're making decisions in the face of ambiguity. The notes that we have to play aren't written on the page, but we still have to perform. And so I think if we can kind of channel our inner jazz musicians, I think that's how entrepreneurs win. That's ultimately how we all are able to achieve our full potential. So we're playing some jazz right now. And this is dangerous because we could go on an improv session for a couple hours. But in the same jazz analogy, correct me if I'm wrong, but in jazz, everyone kind of does have their own little moments where they come into the spotlight and they jam out a little bit. Then it gets back to the group and you're always, and whereas a leader, it's not that top down. It's like, hey, it's your turn. It's your turn. It's your turn. We're feeding off each other and it can go, a song could go 30 minutes. Yeah, that is exactly right. And it's pretty cool. And by the way, like if you're the leader and you think the spotlight only needs to be on you all the time, that's not what jazz is all about. And you're going to have a difficult company. But you're right. In jazz, you know, I will play, let's say, a solo. And your job now is to support me and make me really shine at the detriment, not to the detriment of you, but like if people are focusing on you, you're not doing your job. But then we switch roles. And all of a sudden, my job is to make you just look spectacular. And so this leadership baton gets passed back and forth where you're oscillating between being the sort of spotlight person and then the support person. There's another neat thing that happens in jazz. So that's kind of how solos go. You almost like go in a circle. But then there's something called trading fours. And this is much more like how you think about a comedy improv group, where I play four measures of an idea, and then it's your job to pick it up and build on it in your own way. So I might play an idea in my head, and there's like a little rhythmic component. And then you on a different instrument, pick it up and take it to the next level. And then the drummer takes it to a different direction, and the piano player thereafter. You're sort of bouncing back and forth in real time, And what's created, it's like this co-creation process. Everybody is contributing to the final outcome. And again, to me, that's how successful teams work as well. Oh, fascinating. All right, this is good. Exactly on a complete tangent, this is exactly where I want to go, Josh. I love this because I want to talk about how we get these sessions to happen. Because as you were talking, I started thinking about the best idea paloozas, the best brainstorming sessions started with one thing and then went a whole different direction. And I was literally thinking about, are you familiar with the show Impractical Jokers? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Practical Jokers, funny show. They're all a little jazz too. They come up with ideas. They bounce back and forth each other. It's crazy. It's wrong on so many levels and right on so many levels. So we came up with the idea of doing Impractical Bananas, where our players would tell the player on the field with a mic what to do during the game. And we had a session where we started talking. All of a sudden, Kara, our marketing, jumps and she's like, oh, they could do this. They could literally do this. Then someone else walks and they could do this. And the whole staff jumped in and we started talking about all these crazy ideas we could have the players do during a game. And then all of a sudden, when we did it, everyone was watching because we were all into it because we built it. It wasn't set. This is how the structure of the meeting happens. It was because of a jazz type session. So my question for you is, if you mentioned one before this, how do you get groups to really come together and build this jazz type brainstorming idea paloozas that we have to be even stronger and build new ideas that actually happen and not just, hey, we talked about something for a while? Well, first of all, I really want to say, say something that's important. Like, So you are a good example where everybody's voice in your organization is heard and everybody's ideas count and matter. And so when you do that, when instead of, so too often in an organization, there's a thousand people and like three of them are creative and the rest of them just follow what they're told to do. And that's such a shame because not only are they missing out on ideas, but they're not engaging the rest of the team. And when teams all get to contribute, when everybody's voice matters, when everybody is a creator, not only do you get better ideas, but you perform better. And I look at you. Your business is outperforming other similar teams because everybody's voice is contributing. And even your players, you are winning championships. Your your team plays better because everybody's voice is is heard and because everyone gets to have some fun and be part of the process. So my only point is sometimes we think like, gosh, if I let everybody contribute, performance is going to go down. It's totally the opposite. When everybody contributes, performance accelerates. But back to your question, man. So I've spent 30 years developing what I basically call an innovation toolkit where we've got really specific techniques that extract ideas from people. If you think about very often, people have all these crazy cool ideas and they're locked in the vault, you know, inside of us. How do we release those? How do we unlock the dormant creative capacity? So yeah, I'd be happy to share a couple ideas if that's helpful. Yeah, let's do it. The more ideas that we can walk away, I want a company walk away and say, you know what, I'm going to try this tomorrow. Well, here's the thing. So most of the time when we want ideas, we do a brainstorm. Brainstorming is a perfectly designed exercise to yield mediocre ideas. And the reason is because fear creeps in. If you're sharing an idea, all of a sudden you're responsible for it. And what if you look foolish? And what if your boss doesn't like it? What if you have to execute it? What if you're wrong? So we share our safe, puny ideas and we hold our cool ones back. So what we need is we need a technique, an extraction technique that sends fear off for a coffee and allows our creativity to really soar. So I'll give you a few fun ones. 
First of all, one of my favorites is called role storming. Role storming is brainstorming in character. So you're brainstorming as if you are somebody else. So let's say you're taking on a real problem with the bananas. Like, hey, how can we drive fan engagement and keep people engaged past the seventh inning? But now everybody on your team, they're not like, you know, Jim and Nancy and the normal people. They have to pick a character. So maybe one person is Steve Jobs. No one's going to laugh at Steve for coming up with a cool idea. They might laugh at Steve for coming up with a puny one. So now Nancy, aka Steve, is totally liberated. She can say anything she wants, no fear whatsoever. And so maybe somebody else is Winston Churchill and somebody else is a supermodel and somebody else is a famous author or a villain. Everybody picks their own character. Okay. Each person picks their own character. Okay, you cool. can also just write characters on a little deck and pass them out and peek underneath them. But, but I like it better when people pick their own character. And you brainstorm as if you are that person. And just real quickly, Jesse, I did this with a group of executives one time at Sony Japan. I met this guy. He was like the stiffest human being I've ever met. Anyway, we got him role storming as Yoda. And man, I have never seen personal transformation like this. This dude's jacket's off, his tie's undone. He's like leaping around the room. And the ideas were just flowing. So when you put yourself in a different character, role storm, your creativity is liberating. I love it. So that's one you can do. And then you mentioned also the enemy before this call, which I love. The idea here is basically you invent your arch evil enemy. As I was building my own business, we were in a business of digital promotions, and we really were grateful we got to become the dominant player in our field. But I was worried that complacency would set in or that we would just rest on our old previous success. So we made up a fake competitor, which we called the Slither Corporation. Slither wasn't a competitor to make us feel better. They were always one step ahead of us. They were better funded, more innovative, you know, better resource, deeper pocketed clients, on and on. And so we would often say to ourselves, like, how do you think Slither solved this problem? Or what's your counterpart at Slither doing differently than you? So Slither became a real part of our culture that we talked about all the time and started benchmarking ourselves against the company that never missed their numbers, that never had a down quarter. And so I know most of us on this chat today have real competitors, not trying to be glib about it. But it's really interesting if you say to yourself, what would the ideal competitor do? What if Mark Zuckerberg and Warren Buffett and Bill Gates each put like half a billion dollars in a pot to start a new company, open up down the street from you, and their whole goal was to take you down? Well, what would they do differently? Like, how would they approach the work? And so it's, again, it's a fun technique. If you imagine you work at your own version of Slither, how would they do things differently? Yeah. And Jesse, if you want, I got a couple more fast techniques for you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Keep going, man. All right, cool. So one of them is really fun. You'll dig this. It's called the bad idea brainstorm. So most often when we get together and have a brainstorm, it's like, how do you come up with good ideas? Problem is, again, fear, et cetera. You come up with these puny ideas because the gravitational force of execution, you know, mires your thinking. So here's the way it works. Two-part brainstorm. Part number one, everybody does a sprint on the worst ideas they can think about. What's a terrible idea? What's an illegal, immoral, or unethical idea? What's a just god-awful idea? And so you fill the boards with all these terrible ideas. Everyone's laughing. The energy goes through the roof. Now part two, you then examine the bad ideas for little nuggets of something good. And you say, is there a way that I could do like a legit flip? Could I take the bad ideas? Is there a kernel of something in there that I may need to ratchet down to reality to be clear? but I can make that bad idea something good. And maybe it's in a direction that you would have never thought of in the first place. So toilet paper with your competitor's logo on it, that could have easily come from a bad idea brainstorm. I love it so much. You may be thinking about how we're going to promote some of our t-shirts. We came up with a shirt so good, you don't eat pants. So we started doing commercials with no pants on. Then the one that didn't get approval, one of our guys, one of our new guys, his nipples were hard. And we said, shirts so soft, they'll make your nipples hard. We didn't promote that one. We didn't use that one. These were terrible ideas. But it made us all laugh and it actually brought us together. And I think that bad idea could even just be a culture mover, if anything. Josh, you got me thinking again. It goes back with the falling in love with a problem. And what we've learned is when we have an idea palooza and we're just say, all right, let's think of some new promotional ideas. They're not that great. But when we say, what's a problem? Like we say, you know, what can we do to get fans to stay longer during the game? Or what can we do to get fans to be more engaged during the game, doing something all together? And we ask that question, then solve ideas for that we get much further along. And so I think you can't just say, all right, let's brainstorm about new things we should sell. It's more kind of go around a problem, correct? It is. And back to the jazz analogy for a second. We often think about an idea session as like, you throw an idea out, does that work? Yes or no? If yes, go. If not, kill it. But I would encourage people to instead say, even an idea that isn't ideal, is that an idea that could lead to the idea? Mm. And so it's more about this notion like we do in jazz where, you know, again, I play a solo on guitar, you pick it up on bass, the drummer picks it up a little bit, and then the saxophone plays his ripping solo with standing ovation. So who invented that solo? It was not just the saxophone player, it was this co-creation process where one idea led to the other to the other. 
So when we do a brainstorm session, let's not just judge each individual idea in a vacuum, good or bad, yes or no. It's like, all right, let's give it some breathing room. Maybe that's an idea that's not good on its own, but that idea leads to the next idea, which then leads to the killer idea that you're waiting for. So good. Talk to me about the mousetrap team. The mousetrap team. So I was partners for many years with a guy named Dan Gilbert. Dan famously owns the Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team. He's the founder of uh, Quicken Loans, which is now called Rocket Mortgage, just went public. He's one of the, the billionaires out there. And so Dan is an interesting guy, a very non-traditional leader. And here's what he developed. He had a really interesting thought where he said, I've got all these people working in the business. Who's working on the business? And can you really be charged with rebuilding the plane while you're flying it? So we created a team called the Mousetrap Team, which is essentially their whole job in life was not to actually do the daily work, but to build a better mousetrap. So this was essentially like a process improvement team. And so what they do is they go around and they they were like this multidisciplinary team. There was like art people and technical people. And they would just go around the company examining the way they did their work. They had no responsibility for like delivering a particular result other than figuring out better ways to do the job. And so this mousetrap team was constantly on the lookout for improving techniques, approaches, processes, et cetera. And Dan told me one time, he said, if I was to start a brand new company today, I would start with a CEO and a mousetrap team. He thinks that that's one of the most vital approaches to have a dedicated force that's not responsible for line duty, but rather is looking at the manner in which they do the work and finding a better way. That's the whole principle of a mousetrap team. How do you find a better way? And just real quickly, I know most of us can't afford like a whole standalone team with office equipment and such, but why can't we do a mousetrap team that's just a little carve out? What if it was like a, a task force that you, know, you rotated people in your company and their job was to spend like one hour a week for a month? and examining one process, like how do we distribute tickets or whatever. You could have a rotating team, which is actually probably even better because when those people rotate back in to the regular job, they now have a better worldview altogether. It's so smart bringing people out from outside too. If you're stuck in your own way, you've seen this. This is how we do tickets. You know, I challenge our team, guys, if we did tickets that way last year, what are we doing new this year? Because it's so useful. That worked. doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. And you know, one thing you talk about with that, talk about the Jumbotron, like in, in Rotary Invention, about the metrics and how you kept track of it. I'm trying to think of a jumbotron that we can set up at our office, but that covers experimentation and innovation. Have you had anything set up like that? I know I'm bouncing around, but I'm very curious about this. Yes. So what I wrote about in the book is that if you think about a basketball team, for example, there are hundreds or thousands of metrics that you could be tracking. How many steps did the person take on average per layup or whatever? And so there's all these metrics, but they're not all displayed on the jumbotron. On the Jumbotron is like your most important metrics, like how much time you got left and like what's the score. But everybody sees it. It's in total view at all time. And that helps people guide decisions. They're going to make different behaviors based on those core metrics that are widely shared for everybody. And so the notion in the book that I wrote about was, shouldn't we all have a Jumbotron of our own? And if you're working at a small team or a big one, what are those five or six most important metrics that you're trying to encourage behavior around? So if it's an internal, obviously you have a scoreboard at the games, but for your internal team, What about this? What if it's not only number of experiments tried, but number of failed experiments? Mm. Like if you're not having failed experiments, then maybe you're not pushing the boundaries enough. You know, maybe you should set a threshold that we want a 50% ratio of failed experiments to successful ones, because if not, then we're not getting a little funky. We need to be more funky. And so I think it's fun to, to really reverse engineer what's the desired behavior that you want, and then you kind of design metrics accordingly. Do we want failed experiments? There's a company you talked about that did the failure awards or something. It was a huge ovation. I mean, we want to reward not necessarily failure, we just want to reward the ability to try, right? One of the things that we got to be careful of is there a ritual and reward conflict for what we say. So if we say to someone like, hey, go on, create a bunch of cool ideas, and then someone shows up with a bad idea and they're sent to corporate timeout, you've just trained your team to never share ideas again. So I'm a big fan of rituals and rewards that support the creative process. Mm -hmm. So what you just described, I wrote about, there's a company that I work with that every year issues a failure of the year award. So they have this big banquet and they celebrate other stuff like the team member of the year, but the failure of the year goes for the team or individual that had a great idea. Their numbers made sense, they went for it and it totally failed. But instead of getting fired, they get a standing ovation. People are like clapping and cheering and slapping high five, way to fail. And so I'm not encouraging us to aim for failure, obviously, but think about the message that that sends deep into the DNA of that company about taking responsible risks, about making creativity a part of the daily process. There's another different company they issue every team member two corporate get-out-of-jail-free cards every year. So here's what they say. Go out on a limb. Try crazy stuff. And if you screw something up, hand us a card. You're off the hook. No questions asked. 
And on the annual reviews, a leader will be disappointed with a team member if they haven't used both of them. Mm -hmm. And so again, the message isn't so much that we, you know, you might think like that's really risky, but my sense would be like, what's the risk of not doing something like that? Irrelevance or mediocrity? So the best companies don't eradicate failure. They learn from it. And again, if you were thinking about a barometer, like how many failed experiments, if you have 100% successful experiments, I think that is a terrible failure because that means you're not pushing the boundaries enough. I think if you're not failing at least 20% of the time, ideally maybe closer to 50% of the time, then you're not tapping into that creative verve that you need to meet the challenges of the day. Uh, It's so important. I know we get asked that question. I'm sure you do. What are your biggest failures? And a lot of times as innovators, it's tough for us because we just move on to our next experiment. Like we forget about it a lot. People ask me, I'm like, oh, we fail the time. I just don't pay attention to it. But that's okay because part of your ethos that you just continue to try. I love that. I saw a post, a tweet, you said, reach for weird. Is that in this big, small breakthroughs? What is reach for weird? Because you know I got inspired by that. (laughs) Yeah, so in big little breakthroughs, we cover the eight core obsessions of everyday innovators. And these are sort of like these mantras that people live by. And I live by, frankly, and have been for a long time. And there's some commonalities. You know, I've studied celebrity entrepreneurs and billionaires and regular normal folks like you and me, and there's some commonalities. There's some of our fun. Like one of them is called um, use every drop of toothpaste, which is around being really scrappy. Another one is called don't forget the dinner mint. So if you've ever been to like a really nice dinner and you're with your wife and and all of a sudden someone brings out, oh, this is a little chocolate compliment. Oh, mint, dinner mint. mint. Okay, okay. And it was this unexpected thing that you weren't, you know, planning on. And if you ordered it, it'd be one thing, but because it, it showed up, now it's, it's just heavenly. And so a dinner mint is a small creative flourish that is unexpected. You're plussing up, you're adding what the normal expectation is to create this magical experience for your customers or your team members. And it can be a physical thing like a t-shirt or whatever, but a lot of times a dinner mint is an unexpected experience or an unexpected idea. It's just essentially plussing up. Like when you're right before you're about to ship a work product, you say, all right, what can I do to add a little extra creativity, which can go a very long way. I love it. So for us, when people leave our games, the band's playing, but we also have a free s'more station. That's maybe the dinner mint. What's that extra piece when people are leaving? Steve Jobs is great at that. The one more thing. Whenever he gave a presentation, he always said one more thing. And that was the big add-on at the end. I love that. All right, toothpaste and get weird. So let's talk about get weird because that was what you asked about. So getting weird is challenging ourselves to not only gravitate toward the expected solutions, the safe ones, but really pushing the boundaries to say, all right, what's a bizarre one? What's a unexpected or even unorthodox approach because weird wins, weird matters, weird drives the world forward. A Savannah banana team where the ringleader is wearing a yellow tux, that's weird, but that works. That cuts through the noise. And so the way I would frame this in people's minds is when we make decisions, big or small, we generally narrow the field of choice. So you got to solve a problem. You go from unlimited possibilities to like a very short list, which is generally A, B, and C. So all of a sudden, it becomes a short multiple choice decision, and your A, B, and C ideas are the obvious ones, the things you've always done before. But my suggestion is, ask yourself before choosing A, B, and C, wait a minute, is there a D? Is there an E? Or what I like to say, is there an option X? So option X, that's that weird, oddball, strange idea that makes all the difference in the world. So again, a guy who wears a yellow tuxedo to a baseball game, that's the option X approach. And option X, again, that is absolutely what works. You know, the option X and the weird, it can also be like what that bad idea brainstorming session, you know, when when we decided to have our fans giving game, our team decided a terrible idea that we're not going to feed fans for 66 minutes. We're actually going to starve our fans for 66 minutes because the 66 day journey for the pilgrims over to our country. So literally, it's a terrible idea not feeding fans, but we did it. And that it probably is very weird in option X. But I think more companies need to have these conversations and not be afraid of, I think one challenge is we're wasting time. Well, this could be the best time you spent. The best time you spent. Just on that, because I do want to share another weird example, but you know, people say, I don't have time to be innovative. Real quick way to solve that. First of all, do a 30-day sprint with your team and say, how can I carve out 2% of time through innovation? Like, can we figure out a way to be 2% more efficient? And 2% is nothing. Like, you can figure out, oh, we'll move the printer over here. And, like, we'll save a half a percent here and one-tenth of a percent there. And so just figure out with your team, which I know everybody can figure out how to be 2% more efficient. Then reinvest the time next month. Now you now get 2% more time. And now reinvest that, boom, you've got the time. And so we can use our creativity to solve almost every problem, including the time dilemma. I love it. But back real quick to reach for weird because I'm staring at your funky yellow outfit. Another quick weird example. So it turns out cigarette litter 
is one of the biggest problems in urban environments. Number one pollutant, and it's not only unsightly, but it's like harmful for birds and small animals, even children. And when cigarette butts get dumped in the oceans, they're actually a bigger problem than plastic straws. So how do you solve this problem on a global basis? Okay, it's pretty tough. You can shame people into putting their cigarette butts in the right place, doesn't work. You can increase fines, doesn't work. All these traditional approaches that people have tried just don't work. It took this guy named Trowin Rowenstock, who's in the UK, normal dude like you and me, didn't have a bunch of resources, to invent a better approach, a weird approach. He calls it the ballot bin. So imagine you're in a crowded square outside a bar, and you're about to flick your cigarette onto the ground, but then you notice something in the same bright yellow that your outfit is, and it's mounted to a post, and it's the box. So there's like metal box there, except the front of the box is glass, and there's two little slots to put stuff in. Above those slots, there's a simple question. Which is your favorite food, pizza or hamburgers? And in this case, people are compelled. They see this yellow thing that grabs their attention, and then they walk over, see this thing, and then they vote with their butts. In other words, they stick their cigarette butt in the receptacle, either pizza or hamburgers. And because it's a glass front, there's a real-time tally. You can see how many butts are there and see which people like better, pizza or hamburger. So this guy, Trowin, invents this thing called the ballot bin. And by the way, you can change the questions. It could be any question you want. Do you prefer lager or ale? Is Trump's hair real or fake? (laughs) Any two-part questions and people vote with their butts. So in a world where they've tried like everything, they've thrown money at this, they've had PhDs and Nobel Prize winners, nothing works. Here's what happens. When there's a ballot bin in a town square, cigarette litter is reduced by 80%. This is a reach for weird approach. And the cool thing is like, it didn't require advanced training. You and I could have thought of that ballot bin and, and everyone listening today could think of that. So once again, the power is we have these weird ideas inside of us. We can deploy them one big little breakthrough at a time and together we can do great things. It's fascinating. I think more companies should be talking about, you know, how do you gamify things? You know, they make something that seems just a mundane. They gamified it. They made it fun, especially now the time we're living. We need more fun now than ever. And so you can look at that way. Fun is a huge, huge part of innovation. We could be playing jazz and doing this for a long time, Josh. So I know I got to be conscious here. So we'll have to do it again. But I want to finish with a few questions here, a little rapid fire. Question time. You know, I believe questions are so, so important. What questions are you asking? That brings the greatest answers. What are some of the best questions you're asking right now to companies or innovators as far as what's next and what to do? I'm with you 100%. You know, curiosity is sort of like the building block of creativity. The more curious you are, the more creative you become. One question I love asking is what's missing? So when we're trying to solve a problem, we generally start with what is, and then we might add something to it, but we often don't ask what isn't. And so it's sort of looking for the negative space. What's not there? When you get in the train, the tube in London, the public transportation, it says, mind the gap. I think we should mind the gap and ask ourselves, hey, what isn't there? What's missing? That's a real powerful thing to do. Another thing would be if you're examining something and you're trying to reinvent it, you say, okay, let's start to think about how the idea came to be. So what were the circumstances in 1981 when someone invented this process? What was going on politically? What was the mood of the day like? What were the challenges they were facing? And so you start to say, okay, now what's different? And obviously, a lot of things might be different than 1981. And so if you can kind of connect with the genesis of the idea, you can then start to see why maybe it's not the best solution 40 years later. And maybe there's a different way we can approach it. So I like sort of deconstructing an existing situation, examining it under the hospital light, so to speak, and then rebuilding it in a better way through a series of inquisition. Keep asking, like, why did they do this in the first place? What's changed since then? What do my consumers, how do they behave differently than they did in 1981 when the system was put in place? So good. All right. Innovate now. So from, you know, we're talking about your book, Big Little Breakthroughs. What is something that from the book they could take right now and innovate with their team? We get some good brainstorming sessions, like a little assessment, little thing they can do right now. There's actually a fun assessment on my site, which is biglittlebreakthroughs.com. It's free, by the way. It takes like four minutes. And it's just like the weight that you have, you know, creativity is like your weight, not your height. You know, you can change your weight. You can't change your height. But, you know, tell you, give you a snapshot of how your creativity is doing right now. And I'll give you some pointers where you might want to improve. It's a fun little assessment. It's free, biglittlebreakthroughs.com. But what I would encourage people to do is in the next seven days, whether they're kind of like, hey, this is cool stuff. Maybe I could apply this in my own life. Just keep your eye out for one big little breakthrough, just one. Don't worry about executing it. Don't worry about getting permission or funding. Just say, is there one little teeny tiny thing that I could see that could be changed in the next week? Because when you do that in a small accessible way, then you're like, oh, I see one. Now I maybe see four. And now I see four, maybe I see 17. And so it's a good way of kind of getting in the habit, building a habit of daily creativity. One of the things I would recommend is a little ritual. Um, I do a five-minute ritual, which is also available on my site. 
Um, one thing that I do, I guzzle inputs. So if you think about creativity as the combination of inputs and outputs, what I do is I spend one minute with a timer every day and I guzzle inputs. For me, I often I'll watch a jazz performance on YouTube. Maybe I'll stare at a beautiful piece of art, but I just sort of allow myself to take in the creative mastery of somebody else. Then I spend another one minute, again, keep in mind one minute, not six hours, and I give myself like a creative calisthenics, like jumping jacks. And I'll give myself a challenge like, okay, I have this coffee cup in my hand. What are 17 other uses for a coffee cup? And so it's not designed to have like meaningful work product. It's designed to get your muscles flowing, to build creative muscle mass. So those two things once a day, like guzzle inputs for one minute and give yourself some weird creative challenge. Like, hey, if you were stuck on a desert island and you had to live for three years, how could you do it with only coconut juice or something? But just, just challenge yourself in a weird, bizarre way. And it just, it, you start to build creative muscle mass. You start to make this part of who you are as a human being. And frankly, we're all creative. We just need to unlock it. So good. All right. Final quick three, because I wish I met you when I was 23 as far as a GM of the worst team in the country. I wish I met you then. But if you were to advise someone young, you know, just starting out, what would be the best advice you would tell them to, hey, this is how you can stand out, you know, in business or in life? Yeah. So back to the phrase that you mentioned earlier, which is called a judo flip. It's one of my favorite techniques. Basically, it's this. Instead of trying to blend in, if you're in nature, you want to flock with everybody else because that's safe. You know, birds flock together, for example. But in business and in human life, that is the least, that's the riskiest thing you can do. So you're right. Your job is to stand out. So what I would recommend people do is whatever you're trying to do, let's say you're trying to apply for a job, make a list. How would you ordinarily apply for a job? How does everybody else apply for a job? And then I say, okay, how could I judo flip that? How could I do the polar opposite of it? You know, maybe instead of sending a resume, you send, here's the top 10 reasons why you shouldn't hire me. That'd be a good resume. Love it. That's a judo flip. So I would just encourage people to really explore not what makes them the same, but what makes them different. A year ago, we posted an ad, do not apply for this job. There are only a few applicants, but we found the right one. <laughs> the exact same thing. Love that. I love it. All right, about to. Hey, when I went on your Creative Troublemakers podcast, you asked me the question, what does going bananas mean for me? I'm going to go back to you because obviously I've been very inspired by that question. So back to you, going bananas, what does it mean to you? You know, I've kind of adopted that phrase, thanks to you, my friend, because I just love the notion of going bananas. And it can mean everything can be different to each person go bananas in their own way. But to me, to a degree, it's full throttle. Like, I'm not going to restrict myself. I'm going to let it all hang out. It's a willingness to, to push the creative boundaries, certainly. And it's a willingness to say, okay, how do I want to be remembered? You know, instead of like playing it safe, like how do I want to be remembered? And I want to be remembered as someone who went bananas. So it, it's balking conventional wisdom. It's sort of sticking your eye in the finger of complacency, letting your hair down a little bit. It's amazing to me. Think about all the musical band that you love or, or a place you like to go or a product that you like to buy. I doubt it's the boring ones. It's the compelling ones. It's those people that went bananas. So for some reason, we've been taught in school and by loving parents and stuff to not go bananas. Yet to me, going bananas is that's the path to success that we see. So I really hope that by listening to your podcast on a regular basis, your listeners go bananas. That's the most going bananas I've heard in one answer ever. You said it like 11 times. So thank you for that. Well, that's what here. Hey, Josh, what makes someone unforgettable? I think what makes someone unforgettable is, well, back to your thing, I think it's willing to be unique and compelling and different. It's really just like sort of willing to be who you are. So often, I think we're all trying to conform. We see these messages on social media and we think well, our job is to be like everybody else. But when you're like everybody else, you're totally forgettable. I would say when we were building our company that the worst insult you can have in business is to be confused with a competitor. I would rather get kicked out of somebody's office than to be confused with somebody else. So when you're unforgettable, there's something that's different. When you wear a yellow tuxedo, you can't forget that. And I hope that in my own weird ways that I'm unforgettable as well. Think about the standards that we measure ourselves by. Too often, it's measurements of conformity. I think back to our jumbotron, we should have an unforgettometer that shows us like how unforgettable are we and what are the attributes of being unforgettable and shouldn't that be something that we strive for? Back to your 23-year-old, I would advise every 23-year-old right now, don't focus on blending and focus on being unforgettable. Wow. All right, mic drop right there, Josh. Man, I, uh, I appreciate it. I'll tell you, since I came across your work like six months ago, you've been unforgettable for me, our organization, more than you know. And as our team goes through your books, we can't wait for this next one, which will be coming out soon. But I just want to thank you because I, as I shared, I've listened to every podcast you've been on and everyone I leave inspired and I start taking notes. So thank you for being with me. And I, I appreciate the gift that you're giving to so many people. Well, my pleasure. And right back at you. Thanks for being unforgettable yourself. And I really appreciate that you're going bananas. <laughs> Use it again. I love it. Thanks, Josh. 
Thank you for listening to Business Done Differently, where we believe that challenging the status quo, creating fans first, and changing the game is the best way to grow your business. For more information about the guest and topics covered in this episode, visit findyouryellowtux.com or shoot me a note at jesse at findyouryellowtux.com. Until next time, stop standing still, start standing out.